Over the past several lectures, we've been talking about the electronic structures, first of atoms and then of molecules. Now, as we move on to chapter six, we're going to look at the electronic structure of an infinite crystal. This slide gives us a kind of indication of where we're trying to get to. On the left-hand side, we see the molecular orbital diagram for uh, an octahedral transition metal complex. Right? And you can see, as we've discussed, we have different ligand salks, we have these orbitals on the central metal atom, and we combine them together to get the molecular orbitals for the molecule. But if we have a crystal, in theory, a crystal goes on forever. So there is an infinite number of atoms. Even in a real crystal, which is finite, there is a very large number of atoms. And so it's not going to make sense to think of a crystal as just a huge cluster of atoms and to try and do a calculation in that way. Instead, we're going to represent the electronic structure of a crystal through something called the band structure. And this diagram over here on the right is the band structure for the rhenium trioxide structure, which, as it turns out, is built from transition metal-centered octahedra. So really the goal of what we're trying to do in this chapter is to understand how this diagram on the right, sometimes called a spaghetti diagram by chemists, relates to the atomic orbitals and the bonding. So we're going to follow pretty closely chapter six of our book, uh, Solid State Materials Chemistry. And as you know, I'm one of the authors of that book, and chapter six was one that I was heavily involved in writing. However, I do just want to point out that this scientist, Roald Hoffman from Cornell, did a lot of the really important early thinking about how to talk about the electronic structures of these crystals in the language of chemistry. And so this little book here, which is, I think, maybe 140 pages, that was published in 1989, that was a, a very influential book for me, and you can still find it. So if you want to dig a little bit deeper, then I'm able to go in chapter six of the book, and this would be an excellent resource. On our journey to the structure of an infinite solid, let's start with molecules, and let's build those molecules up bigger and bigger until they get to something that looks like an infinite solid. So in this lecture, we're going to keep things as simple as we possibly can. We're going to talk about molecules where the only atom is hydrogen, which of course only has one valence atomic orbital to deal with. And we're going to limit our discussion to a one-dimensional solid. And so what do I mean by that? I mean just an infinite chain. So there's translational symmetry in one dimension, but not in all three. Now, if you take an infinite chain of hydrogen atoms and chop it up into smaller and smaller segments, the smallest such segment would be the H2 molecule. Right? And a couple of lectures ago, we talked about the MO diagram of an H2 molecule. We've got a bonding molecular orbital, shown here. We've got an antibonding molecular orbital, shown here. Now, if we make this molecule bigger, but make it into a ring, you can go to a ring of six hydrogen atoms. And the MO diagram for this molecule is entirely analogous with the pi bonding in benzene that we talked about a couple lectures back. We can keep making the molecule bigger. Here's 10 hydrogen atoms. Here's a ring of 14 hydrogen atoms. Here's the calculated molecular orbital energies for a ring of 50 atoms. And there's some common trends that come out of this analysis. Firstly, as we know from MO theory, the number of molecular orbitals here is going to be equal to the number of atoms because each hydrogen atom has only one atomic orbital to deal with. We can see that no matter how big we make the ring, we're going to fill up exactly half of the molecular orbitals, right? And that's a consequence of the fact that each hydrogen atom has one orbital that can hold two electrons, but only one valence electron. And as the molecule gets bigger and bigger, you see the energetic spacing between the molecular orbitals gets smaller. There's still a fair spacing here when we get to 50 atoms in our ring. But if I were to go to 1,000 atoms, if I were to go to 10,000 atoms, if I were to go to a million atoms, 
right, which is still not a very big crystal, by the way, then uh, you know, the spacing would get very, very close. And if we were to go to something that was infinite, what we would see is that there's an infinite number of molecular orbitals, but only half of them are filled. We also see something that we're going to come back to in a minute, and that is notice at the bottom and at the top that the molecular orbitals are more closely spaced, whereas in the middle, the spacing between them is a little further apart. So remember that. Later on in this lecture, we're going to come back to that. You noticed on the last slide that I drew pictures with orbitals shaded light or dark until I got to the one that was you know, infinity, and then I just shaded things in. How do we construct or think about the orbitals that exist in an infinite solid? It's worth remembering that when we constructed the electronic structure of a molecule, we use molecular orbitals, and those molecular orbitals we took to be linear combinations of atomic orbitals. Well, we're going to do the same thing for a crystal. Okay, we're going to build up these orbitals, which I'm going to call crystal orbitals, as linear combinations of atomic orbitals. Now, we're going to do it with this mathematical function, which is called the block function. On the left here, this psi of x, that is our wave function. So it's just a mathematical function, and the x is the position along this infinite one-dimensional chain. That wave function is made of two different components. We have this u of x. We're going to call that the basis set. And that's going to be a function that is periodically repeating. In other words, even in a one-dimensional crystal, we still have a unit cell. And the basis set function is going to be exactly the same in every unit cell. Now, as we will see, the basis set we're going to choose here is going to be the molecular orbitals of the molecule or atoms within the unit cell. And of course, the molecular orbitals are made from atomic orbitals. So for the hydrogen atom chain that we're talking about in today's lecture, the basis set is just the wave function of a hydrogen 1s orbital. But then we have this other term, this e to the i k x. Right? So this is a complex number. That's what the i means. And the point of this term is it's going to impose the periodicity of the lattice. We saw when we constructed ligand salks that we used the symmetry of the molecule to tell us what the phases of the orbitals in the salk were. We're going to do something very similar here. This e to the i k x term is going to tell us what are the coefficients in front of the atomic orbitals in every unit cell. By adding this term, we're going to add in the periodicity of the lattice. Now let me point out through a relationship called Euler's relationship that we could also write e to the i k x as cosine of k x plus i sine k x. Everything I've said so far, if you thought about it for a minute, it should be kind of familiar. Well, the u to the x. I mean, that's, we just said that's going to be the hydrogen 1s wave function. Well, we know what that is. Then we've got the e to the i k x. And we know what x is. That's the position in the chain. But what about k? What is k? What's its physical significance? What values of k are allowed? Let's try and explore that question. Let's try and start by figuring out what is the range of k values that we need to consider. So here's our infinite one-dimensional chain. If you want, it's probably a little bit easier for right now not to think of it as being infinite, but just think about it as being one of those rings of hydrogen atoms. Let's make n large enough that the curvature of the ring can be neglected. So let's say we have a ring of 10,000 hydrogen atoms. Now, if we start at some point, like half an angstrom from the hydrogen that we're going to call the origin, and we were to gonna go all the way around the ring, so if it had 10,000 atoms in it, so we go 10,000 times the lattice constant, A, which is the spacing between hydrogen atoms, we would be back around to the same point. And therefore, the wave function has to keep the same value. So we can say that the value of the wave function at x must be equal to the value of the wave function at x 
plus capital N times A, where capital N is the number of atoms in the ring and A is their spacing. So when we let the chain become infinite, we'll see that we can just call this a periodic boundary condition. When we get to the boundary, the value of the wave function at one end has to be the same as it is at the other end. That we can rewrite the wave function, psi of x, as e to the i k x times u of x. And then on the right-hand side, we've got a different argument. It's x plus n a. But remember, we said the basis set u has to be the same in every unit cell. It has to be identical. It has to have the periodicity of our crystal. And so therefore, u of x must be equal to u of x plus any integer times the lattice constant a. So that term just drops out. And so then we have e to the i k x equals e to the i k times x plus n a. But using the power of exponentials, we can rewrite that as e to the i k x times e to the i k n a. Let's use Euler's relationship now, just for the second term. Let's write e to the i k n a as cosine of k n a plus i sine of k n a. Now, if you look at this for a minute, it's not too hard to work out that this term in brackets has to be 1 for this equality to hold. Because only if it's 1 is e to the ikx going to be equal to e to the ikx. If it takes any other value, the equality would be violated. So let's think about what would make this term in brackets equal to 1. Well, if we think in radians, you know, if that thing in the brackets became equal to some integer of 2 pi, then we'd be golden. Right? Cosine of 2 pi is 1. Sine of 2 pi is 0. Cosine of 4 pi is 1. Sine of 4 pi is 0. So forth and so on. So that means that k, which we still haven't really figured out what k means, but it's a variable, times n, capital N is the number of atoms in our chain, times A, the spacing between them, the unit cell constant, if you want to think about it that way, must be equal to some integer times 2 pi. Let's rearrange this so we solve for k. So k is going to be equal to small n, which is just an integer, times 2 pi divided by large n times the lattice constant A. Okay, let's think about the MOs in a large but finite ring. Right, if we have 10,000 atoms in our hydrogen ring, that means there must be 10,000 molecular orbitals. If we let the value of small n be either positive or negative, it means you know it could be 1 and minus 1. It could be 2 and minus 2. It could be 3 and minus 3. All the way up to plus 5,000 and minus 5,000. And at that point, we would have generated a molecular orbital for every atom in the crystal. Now, if you look at this for a minute, you say, well, what if I let my ring get bigger and bigger? Not 10,000, but 100,000, a million, 10 million. Well, what's going to happen is these values of K are going to get ever closer together as capital N gets bigger. But you know what? The endpoints aren't going to change. Because this last term out here, it's just going to be pi over a, no matter what value capital N takes. Right? So as capital N goes to infinity, as the molecule size goes to infinity, the range of this series doesn't change. It goes from minus pi over a to positive pi over a. So this range of k values is called the first Brewan zone. And really, to the electronic structure, the first Brewan zone is like the unit cell is to the crystal. Once we know the electronic states in this range of k values, we know everything we need to know about the electronic structure. Okay, so this might all seem slightly abstract to you, so let's illustrate it with an example. Let's go to our one-dimensional chain of hydrogen atoms. We're going to let this be infinite now. And let's write the mathematical functions for our different crystal orbitals. 
So let's start with k value b0. This would be right at the center of the first Brillouin zone. So this is the formula for our crystal orbital. But if k is 0, then we're going to have e to the 0 times the wave function of the 1s orbital that is at the origin. This one's going to become e times 0 times the wave function of the 1s orbital that's at one unit cell from the origin, and two unit cells, and three unit cells, and four unit cells, and so on and so forth. But the key thing is that the coefficient in front of each of these orbitals is going to be 1. Right? e to the 0 power is 1, regardless of what x is, regardless of where we are on the chain. So now our wave function is just the sum of the hydrogen atom wave functions at each atom in the chain. So if we were to just draw out the first six atomic orbitals, it would look something like this. And you can see from looking at this picture that all of the orbitals are going to interact constructively. And so this is going to be a bonding MO. And in fact, you cannot imagine any way to combine all of these hydrogen 1s orbitals to get a state that is any more bonding. So this is going to be the most bonding state in the first Brillouin zone. This is going to be our lowest energy crystal orbital. We could plot this mathematically. Here on the left, I'm showing just a summation of a 1s orbital on each hydrogen atom. So these little dots represent the positions of the nuclei of the hydrogen atoms. And this plot up here, I've just added their individual wave functions. Then the e to the i k x term, when k is 0, is just going to be 1. So this term just becomes a constant. And therefore, the crystal orbital wave function looks just like the sum of the hydrogen 1s atomic orbital wave functions. That's the mathematical description of it. Now, let's go to another point in our first B1 zone, and now we're going to go all the way to the largest value of k we can experience and still be in the first B1 zone, and that would be k equals pi over a. Right? Remember, a is our one-dimensional unit cell constant, the spacing between hydrogen atoms. I'm going to start again with this same formula, but now, of course, k is not zero. It's pi over a. So we're going to Make it pi over a everywhere, but the x value changes. All right? So for the atom at the origin, right, right at that nucleus, the x value would be 0. For the atomic orbital that is at one unit cell from the origin, there the x value is going to be 1 times the unit cell parameter. For the hydrogen atom that is two unit cell constants from the origin, the x value is going to be 2a so forth and so on. Now, if we think about Euler's function here, right, this whole term here is going to be 0. So it's going to be e to the 0. Okay, that's going to be a 1. The next one is going to be i to the pi. Right, the a's are going to cancel. Well, cosine of pi, right, in radians, pi is 180 degrees. Because cosine is minus 1, sine is 0. Then we look at the next one. This one's going to be 2 pi. Cosine of 2 pi is positive 1, and sine is 0. And then we're going to have 3 pi. And that's going to be, uh, once again, a negative 1. So we're going to get an alternation between the coefficient in front of our atomic orbital being a positive 1 or a negative 1. Positive, negative, positive, negative. Graphically, that looks something like this. We have this hydrogen 1s orbital with a positive phase, this one with a negative phase. Positive phase, negative phase. All of the interactions between the nearest neighbors are going to be destructive in nature. These are antibonding interactions. And in fact, it's not possible to think of a crystal orbital that would be more antibonding than this one. Mathematically, you know, our basis set is still just the sum of the hydrogen 1s orbital wave functions. But now the e to the ikx term looks different.
Here I'm plotting the real part of that wave function, and you can see it's an oscillating term. And so it goes from positive 1 at this nucleus, negative 1 at the next one, positive 1, negative 1, positive 1, negative 1. Right? So when we multiply these two together, what we find is we have here, the wave function has a positive sign. On the next hydrogen atom, it has a negative sign. On the next one, a positive sign. And in between these two, of course, it's got to go through zero. It has a node. Right? This is the characteristic feature of an antibonding orbital. Right? So when we put this all together, we have what we call this band structure. What is this spaghetti diagram? Although here, we have a very simple spaghetti diagram. It's only made with one piece of spaghetti, you might say. But there's some things that we can get from it at k equals zero, at the center of the first Brillouin zone, we have a crystal orbital where all the interactions are bonding. So that's got to be the lowest energy crystal orbital. At pi over a, we saw that all of the interactions are antibonding. That's got to be a higher energy. In fact, it's got to be the highest energy crystal orbital we're going to find in the first Brillouin zone. If we were to go in the negative k direction, you know, because of the properties of the cosine and the sine terms, we're going to get basically a mirror image. Now, from what we've done so far, we only really determine the energies of three points. So we don't really know if this should be straight lines between these points or, or this curve that I've shown here. The curve I've shown here is calculated with extended Huckel theory. So if you were to go through and do those calculations, you can see that it has something that's almost parabolic shaped in nature. But we might take a minute just to think about what the crystal orbital would look like somewhere in between these two extremes. Let's take pi over 2a. It would be halfway between the center of the first Brillouin zone and then the boundary of it. So at pi over 2a, because now the denominator has a 2 in it, it's still going to be a sinusoidally varying function. But it's just that the repeat distance is now going to get longer. So we have to go four unit cells before the wave function starts repeating. So we see that the e to the ikx term, it has what we could call a wavelength. And that wavelength here is 4a. Now more generally, we can say that the wavelength is going to be equal to 2 pi divided by the value of k. Right here, k is pi over 2a. So if we plug that in, we're going to come up with a wavelength of 4 times the unit cell constant a. When we multiply this function times our basis set, we get this crystal orbital. If we were going to draw a picture of this, here we would have you know, a negative phase. At the next atom over, the wave function goes to zero. There's a node at the next atom, so we don't draw an orbital at all. Then at the next one, now we have a positive phase, and then a missing orbital because of the node, and then a negative phase. Here, you can see that the nodal planes are now two atoms apart. Remember when it was k equals pi over a, between every single atom, we had a node. So this orbital is less antibonding, and therefore not as high in energy as the wave function at pi over a, but on the other hand, higher in energy than it was at k equals zero. All right, maybe we can now return to this question about what exactly is this variable k. And the answer is we can think of k in a variety of ways. In one sense, every crystal orbital is going to have a different value of k. If it's a finite ring rather than an infinite chain, and that finite ring has 10,000 atoms, then there's 10,000 different values of k and each one is a different molecular orbital. In an infinite crystal, there's an infinite number of values of k, but each one of them describes a different crystal orbital with different phasing of those hydrogen 1s wave functions. So it determines the coefficients that are in front of the different atomic orbital wave functions. And so in that sense, we can think of it as a label. We also saw that the value of k tells us something about how rapidly these coefficients oscillate from positive to negative. Right? So it tells us something about how rapidly the 
atomic or molecular orbitals within the unit cell oscillate. From that, we can get basically a wavelength of our crystal orbital. And then we could use de Broglie's relationship, which tells us that the momentum of an object, a matter wave, is equal to Planck's constant divided by the wavelength of that matter wave. If we use this value of lambda from up here and plug it into de Broglie's relationship, then we get this relationship. The momentum of the electron is equal to h bar times the value of k. And so we see that k also tells us something about the momentum of the electron. And in that sense, it's called a crystal momentum. And we'll see for things like optical transitions, that has important consequences. Now, how can we relate what this band structure looks like to the real space details of the crystal structure? Well, here we have something incredibly simple. Right? We just have an elemental solid. It only extends in one dimension. So there's not that much we can do. But we could change the spacing of the atoms. The electronic structure that's plotted here shows the band structure if we had the hydrogen atoms one angstrom apart, just arbitrarily. And you can see that the highest energy crystal orbital has an energy of about 20 electron volts, and the lowest energy crystal orbital has an energy of about minus 20 electron volts. If we were now to make the atoms more widely spaced, say two angstroms apart, what would that do? Well, it wouldn't change the symmetry of the band. It would still have this kind of parabolic type curvature. However, now at k equals zero, there would be less overlap of the orbitals. It would be less bonding. And so its energy would not be as deep. And you can see here that the energy of the all bonding crystal orbital now is higher in energy than it was when the atoms were more closely spaced. And by the same token, when we get to the edges of the Brillouin zone, we can see that the antibonding interactions have also been reduced dramatically. And so the energy here has come down a lot. And so in the end, we get something we call the band width. That's the energy width between the bottom and the top of a band. And when you have a lot of overlap from one unit cell to another, you get a band that is wide. We also might say it's dispersed. Right? And so these kind of bands, as we'll see, are going to be good for delocalized electrons. But when you have orbitals that have small amount or minimal amount of overlap from one unit cell to the next, well, then the bandwidth becomes very narrow. And we'll see that narrow bands are typically associated with localized electrons. Okay, the last point I want to touch on in today's lecture is to talk about something called a density of states plot. Okay, so these full band structures, these spaghetti diagrams, they're kind of complicated. Sometimes we want to represent them in a little bit more simplistic way. And so we can do that with something called a density of states plot. What the density of states plot is going to do, it's going to basically say how many crystal orbitals are there in an energy range from E to E plus delta E, as delta E goes to zero, right? So this is just kind of a calculus thing. And what we can see here, if we look at our band structure of our hydrogen atom chain, is that at the bottom and at the top, it gets a little bit flat. So that means if I were to take a finite energy range, let's say a tenth of an electron volt, say, well, how many states are within that tenth of an electron volt? Well, when the band is flat, there can be a lot of states in that narrow energy window, right? And so that's what we see at the bottom and the top. And you can see that there are peaks in the density of states at the bottom and at the top. Now, in the middle, the band is steeper, right? So just changing k a little bit leads to a bigger change in energy. So if we were to take the same energy slice here, it would capture fewer crystal orbitals within that narrow energy range. And so the density of states function goes through kind of a minimum around the middle of the band. Now, I said at the very beginning of this lecture 
Remember those MO diagrams for the 50 atom hydrogen ring and how the orbitals were pretty closely spaced at the bottom and the top, but more spread out in the middle. Well, we can see that when we look at this density of states plot for an infinite hydrogen atom chain. We will oftentimes use density of states plots to get basic details of the electronic structure. Even though they, they don't capture everything we can see in the full electronic band structure plot, they do give important information about the electronic structures of crystals.